you, Charlie. All right, thank you. And, and thank you everybody for, uh, for coming. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about estuarine ecology. And uh, as we were thinking about, you know, what is it exactly that we're gonna uh, talk about? And I thought, you know, rather than, than talking and doing PowerPoint, showing you pictures, uh, why don't I just show you a video so you can see all the things and or rather some of the things uh, that we're up to and so this video that I'm about to show you is um, specifically uh, with our seagrass research team on a, on a project that we've been working on for the past two or three years. So I will see if I can share my screen, get your popcorn ready and uh, let's see. Oops. Can you see that? We can see it, Charlie. Okay. I'm trying to figure out how to. Uh... We're good? Well, hey, everybody. My name is Charlie Martin, and I'm an estuarine ecologist at the Nature Coast Biological Station. And today, I want to tell you a little bit about our research here in the Cedar Key area. First, we have a large team of collaborative researchers from other faculty at UF to undergraduate and graduate students and research scientists, and I wanna make sure that I acknowledge them for their contributions to the broader scope of our work on estuarine ecology here at the station. Estuaries are rich and productive waters where rivers meet the sea, and today I wanna to talk a little bit about the Suwannee River Estuary, where we have a considerable amount of ongoing research. And these estuaries are highly dependent on the quality and quantity of fresh water coming from this watershed. And the problem is that there are a lot of demands on this water from agriculture and municipal extraction to changes in climate and weather patterns that affect rainfall, precipitation. And this is critical for the brackish, mid to low salinity waters that form at the mouths of these estuaries that are so productive for our fish and shellfish and I'd like to acknowledge that some more of this will be addressed in future webinar content. Today, what I want to talk about is, is how our estuary here in Cedar Key compares to other major estuaries around the Gulf. And to do that, I'm going to focus on one of the most widespread and cosmopolitan habitats throughout the Gulf, and that is seagrass, and specifically turtle grass, the Lassia testudinum. Estuaries are important for grass beds because freshwater brings terrestrial sources of carbon and nutrients that are sources of food for the plants and phytoplankton and so on up the food web. And these grass beds provide a whole suite of what we term ecosystem services or benefits provided by these habitats. And a few examples of these benefits include improving water quality and clarity, providing a buffer for storms, storing carbon from the atmosphere, um, providing food and a forage base for animals and offering hiding places for the young of many fish and invertebrates through the three-dimensional structure that it provides and for that reason these grasses have frequently been referred to as nursery habitat so i want to tell you a little bit about how the seagrass in our estuary here in cedar key compares to seagrass in other estuaries throughout the Gulf in terms of some of these important benefits, especially as it relates to the habitat that they provide and how the animals grow and survive in these areas. And in the process, I'll also tell you a little bit about the methods and techniques that we use to answer these questions. So these are the estuaries that we're comparing from the Laguna Madre and Coastal Bend in Texas to the Chandelier Islands in Louisiana and several sites St. George Sound near Carabelle in the Panhandle, right here in Cedar Key, and farther south in Charlotte Harbor. And these abbreviations, LM, CB, LA, SG, CK, and CH, will be used throughout this presentation. So before I get started, I do want to mention that this was a highly collaborative project funded by NOAA Restore, and we had teams in other areas using identical methodology and timing, and I want to acknowledge these folks and their teams for the work, their work to make this possible. 
So to sample really tiny animals, things like amphipods, snails, the small shrimps that live in these grass beds, we use what's called a benthic sled, which is pulled through the grass, it slides over the top of the sediment so it doesn't rip the grass out, and all the animals in the grass get captured in the net at the cod end. From there, they all get identified, counted, and weighed, and from these, we can compare how invertebrate and small fish communities change in these grass beds throughout the Gulf of Mexico. And what we find is that species richness or the number of kinds of different animals living in turtle grass compared to bare sediment especially um, here in Cedar Key which I'll circle is especially high and the sites here go from west in Texas to east in Florida and so we know this is a very diverse area but so too are the numbers of animals that we catch using this technique. And you can see that compared to other grass beds around the Gulf, the Suwannee River estuary here in Cedar Key has a lot of these animals. We also sample some of the larger fish and invertebrates in these grass beds using otter trawls, not unlike those used in many areas to, to catch shrimp, just a bit smaller. And to do this, we deploy our tow net behind a boat uh, we tow it for a set amount of time, then retrieve it and identify, count, and measure all the animals that we catch. And because this trawl is very light, it doesn't damage these grass beds. And sampling using this technique also highlights the diversity in our estuary's grass beds with on average more species per sample than the other sites uh, throughout the Gulf. And when we look at the number in terms of total abundance of animals, we also see that they're very high in turtle grass, and we can also look at the sheer volume or biomass of these animals. And we also see that they're especially high in Cedar Key as well. Well, we know we have a lot of animals of many different types, uh, but we also compare other metrics. For example, how quick do animals grow here compared to these other estuaries. And we look at this specifically using what's called growth cages. Uh, these growth cages are deployed. They're anchored into the sediment in these grass beds. For this work, we looked at the growth of juvenile blue crabs. Uh, the blue crabs are a major, major commercial organism uh, targeted throughout the Gulf. Uh, we tag crabs with um, an elastomer uh, we release them into cages, and then we come back after a set amount of time, recapture them, uh, measure them again to get a measure of how fast they grow across these estuaries. And in this sampling, we found that the growth of crabs here in Cedar Key and farther south in Charlotte Harbor had some of the highest growth rates found throughout the whole Gulf. Finally, we also want to know a little bit more about these crabs in terms of how frequently they get eaten. How do they survive in these grass beds? To do this, we used a, a very simple technique that ecologists have used for a really long time, and that's called tethering. And to do this, we simply attach a small crab to a piece of monofilament fishing line using super glue, and then we stake it out in the grass beds for a 24 hour period, and then come back and simply measure how many survived. And this gives, gives us an easy comparative measure of the predation potential in all these different areas and tells us a little bit about the process of predator-prey interactions and food web differences that might be present in these different estuaries throughout the Gulf. Um, and we find that the percent of crabs that survive a 24-hour period uh, tethering here in Cedar Key is on par with survival in the estuaries that were shown to have some of the highest survival rates, for example, the Laguna Madre and Coastal Bend in Texas. And this highlights the importance of that physical structure that seagrass provides and allows these crabs to hide and reduce their encounter rates with predators. So with these data in mind, I hope that I've given you a little bit of insight into what a special place this area is here in the Suwannee River watershed in terms of the biodiversity and the numbers and kinds of animals that live here, as well as the production and abundance of these animals. And when it comes to important processes such as growth and survival, our grass beds are on par with some of the highest estimates measured
throughout the Gulf in this study. And finally, this work highlights the key role that these seagrass habitats play in our ecosystems. And as many of our estuaries continue to be modified by human development and changes in the amount and quality of, of fresh water uh, coming from our watersheds, we need to be mindful of how upstream changes will affect the functioning of our estuaries further downstream. Thank you for your time. Okay. Great. Thanks for that presentation, Charlie. Yeah. Hopefully everybody's awake. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's the end of the prepared content and we're lucky to have Charlie and and Laura Reynolds and then also several of their students here on uh, the panel and also Ashley McDonald who is a postdoc researcher with them. So we have a really exciting panel for you guys and um, feel free to type in questions. We've already had one question come into the chat and that is what affects the cover of, of epiphytic algae on seagrass and have there been changes in algal cover over time and that's from David Kaplan. Well, that's a that's a great question. Uh, thanks, Dave. That's a hard question, but, um, and, and I can tell you, I don't exactly uh, know the answer to that, but I do know there's some good long-term data sets that have been taken by uh, the Florida Fish and Wildlife um, Conservation Commission at the, the research, Fish and Wildlife Research Institute, um, as well as the St. Martin's Preserve. Um, and uh, maybe, Laura, maybe you have um, some ideas about other sources of that information um, as well, or, or Ashley as well. Um, yeah, the um, DEP um, monitors uh, the monitors um, epiphytic algae on seagrasses um, once a year. Um, I don't know that we have um, um, super clear trends. Um, the things that can affect epiphytic algae on seagrasses are our nutrients. If we have more nutrients in the water, we're going to have more more epiphytic algae and also all those animals. Um, a lot of them eat epiphytic algae, so the, what, what animals are there can also affect, affect the algae. Yeah, just looking at the pictures remind me of some um, video and images in spring, you know, freshwater spring ecosystems that of course have epiphytic algal, at least what is uh, thought of as overgrowth at times um, and thought to be tied to nutrients, but sometimes not so, so clear that connection and thinking about the dynamics of you know, just wave motion velocity and um, physical removal as well as, you know, um, being consumed. So I'm just interested if there's, if it's been getting more nutrient, you know, more nutrient delivery to the coast, has that been at all deleterious either, you know, causing blooms of algae either attached or by shading or some other mechanism? Yeah, that's a, that's a great, uh, great point. So for all these samples that we took, we took multiple cores uh, that we've been <laughs> slowly working up in, in the lab to uh, <clears throat> get at, you know, how these individual plant metrics and, and things like epiphytes uh, affect um, our catches, the survival, the growth, all those sort of things. But uh, from that data, I, I think we could get at some of the questions that you mentioned about wave exposure uh, because, you know, we, we have grass beds all over the place in protected and exposed areas. So, uh, yes, thanks. Great, thanks guys. So we have another question um, from Corinne asking, do you have a link to the study at all? Really cool research. Yeah, let me see if I can uh, pull that up and uh, if I can find it, I'll put it in the chat box for you. And um, in the meantime, if you wanna go on to the next question, Okay, great. And also I'll just announce to everyone that we'll share a link to the recording as a follow up to this as well. So you'll have that link as well, Corinne. Okay, we have another question from Joyce Clean and she's asking, do you bring all the spe species back to the lab for ID or field ID and release? Yeah, so a little bit of both. Uh, we try to work everything up in the field, release it. Um, if, if there are any identification questions, we have to bring it back and use uh, what's called dichotomous keys to key them out um, to, to get the exact species. All right, great. So keep those questions coming, everybody. We just had another one come in. Um, 
Do you have a feel for which species are causing the greater richness in Cedar Key compared to further south like Charlotte Harbor? Yes, um, and I anticipated that question, so thank you. Um, let me see if I can pull up some more data for you. Uh, let's see, I can share screen again. During this study, we caught an incredible amount of pinfish. <laughs> Um, so here's some, uh, uh, some, some numbers on uh, community structure and the abundance prevalence. Uh, that's in you know, what, what was called in uh, percent of, of trawls. Uh, for example, Cedar Key and Charlotte Harbor, which was specifically what you're asking about. A lot of pinfish, silver perch, and pigfish. Um, some of the, the differences are maybe a little more uh, subtle things like uh, toadfish here and uh, the spot tail pinfish, which were more abundant here in the Cedar Key area. Um, so, this is something that we're continuing to work on. Uh, we're continuing to tease apart. It's a, it's a really large data set, and it was, uh, you know, all these different states have monitoring programs associated at the state level, but they're all very different. So, this was the first. Uh, study in the inshore waters to kind of standardize everything. We, we all went out at the same time and, and tried to, to take these samples. So it was a really exciting thing to be a, a part of. Great. Nice, Charlie. It's always great when you get to use your supplemental slides that you prepare. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then also, uh, everybody, he put a link in the chat to more about this research. All right, well, I'm not seeing any, any more questions in the chat. Oh, this is just great timing, everybody. <laughs> so um, Current Problems asks, what are the largest conservation concerns for Cedar Key and the mouth of the Suwannee River? Ooh, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. Uh, definitely the amount of fresh water and the hydrology. Um, I know a lot of folks um, in this group are, are working on those sort of questions. Those are really um, important questions because uh, those environmental variables affect a lot of things within the estuary. Um, and uh, it's the hydrology changes is not something that you can always point a direct finger at. You can, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of different things. Uh, extraction of water, climate change, a lot of different variables going on. Um, so I think that's one of the bigger issues uh, locally here in Cedar Key. There, um, some of the major issues are, um, it, for seagrass at least, uh, prop scars and, and boat damage. There's been a lot of, um, a lot of boating uh, in this area, I, I think compared to historically. Um, I don't have data to say that, but that just seems like um, anecdotally that's the case. Okay, uh, Savannah had to hop off, so I'm going to start reading some of the other questions. Uh, this is Emily, by the way, Emily Colson. <laughs> uh, glad everyone's here. So, Corrine has another question. Any rare or endangered species you found in Cedar Key or any species you didn't expect or were surprised by? Yeah, yeah. So, in this study, we, um, we didn't catch any rare or endangered species. Um, we did catch some surprising species, some parrotfish, uh, some small wrasses that are typically associated with uh, more tropical waters, so potentially something that's being uh, driven north and, and expanding north due to uh, less hard freezes and warmer temperatures. Um, you know, we saw quite a bit of manatees uh, on occasion, especially here in Cedar Key. Um, Ashley, anything to add? Um, I was just going to say um, something just really neat was when we found all the, um, on occasion, we find the, like the juvenile hogfish, which are right. really, really neat. And those are a little more rare, I guess, than maybe not necessarily, you know, 
endangered or rare to the area, but just rare to come across in our trawls. That's right. And, and uh, the life history of, of hogfish is something that, you know, is still kind of up in the air. You know, where, where do they spawn? Where do their recruits go? And, um, when do they recruit offshore to the uh, um, reefs and uh, adult fishery? So it's interesting to see those popping up around here in the seagrass beds. Any elasma branks? Hmm. We definitely couple, caught. Yeah, I think we caught a couple of rays. <laughs> rays. Definitely right. a few different species yeah. of rays. Um, trying to think if we caught any bonnet heads. They're definitely abundant in these seagrass beds. We, de we definitely see them a lot on our trips out and while collecting seagrass data and trawling data, but I don't think we ever got any actually in the trawls. So. Yeah, they're, they're a little bit larger for this type of gear, uh, so they can outswim the trawl and avoid it. Um, so really we're looking at fish that are, you know, pretty, you know, yeah, this big. <laughs> uh, or really benthic associated uh, fish, um, like, like a stingray that relies on burrowing in the, the sediment and sand to, uh, to avoid capture. Okay. And there's another one. Uh, would you recommend any of the sampling techniques? Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a, that's a great point. And we've actually used uh, this sampling as a jumping off point to uh, get a long-term data set started on uh, seagrass associated fish and uh, in the meantime we're doing percent cover of the grass beds we're growing the same sites over time so we've we've kept up with uh portions of this sampling um, but i think it's a it's a really good um opportunity for that i know uh florida fwc does uh long-term sampling for um for some fish uh, but there's a lot of things that have fallen through the cracks, things that you would catch in that benthic sled, like those little era shrimps and snails and things that don't necessarily get uh, quantified. Okay. Right. Dave. Dave asking some hard ones. Got a good one, Dave. <laughs> uh, so in comparing across estuaries, can you draw any inferences on how your results were affected by different disturbance regimes experienced at each site, for example, hurricanes, coastal development, oil, freshwater flow, et cetera. Yeah, so that's a, that's a great point. And so all these different sites have all sorts of different things going on, right? You know, we're here in the Suwannee River, but the site of the Chandelier Island is right in the lee of the Mississippi River watershed, which is the largest watershed in, uh, in the country. Um, so there are different, uh, and, and things that we can't control, some potentially confounding factors we can't control. Um, so what's interesting about this study is, you know, by focusing on just the seagrass, we can compare, you know, how just, just the seagrass communities uh, change. And, and during this study, uh, Hurricane Michael uh, came through the area. So we had just sampled, uh, we did the St. George Sound uh, site as well, and, and that was when Hurricane Michael hit the panhandle. So we were able to leverage our work with this project to get a little more money to, to continue to sample after that hurricane. So hopefully we can tease apart some little things like hurricanes, but um, you're absolutely right in that there's a ton of things that vary across the Gulf that you can't really make an apples to apples comparison with. And, um, but I think there's still good value in this and knowing how seagrass affects um, efficient invertebrate assemblages across a uh, really large spatial scale. All right, good questions, one after the next. Anyone, have anyone else? All right. I do want to let everyone know that we have another talk at 4.30, so starting soon before everyone signs off. I do have a poll. 
an evaluation call if anyone can fill that out for us that would be great before you leave wait they're evaluating me <laughs> go ahead and launch that evaluate charlie right <laughs> i didn't know this was part of the deal <laughs> <laughs> and we still have a few minutes for last minute questions i will post the link to the next talk if anyone wants to attend it is about snook so another fun topic posted the zoom link in the chat you will have to register for that one as well all right another one another last last minute question speaking of sampling what is your opinion on the frequency needed to track status and trends in seagrass and do you think linear east to west transects are useful for looking at cross habitat trends? Yeah, so the frequency, you know, how often um, should we be sampling? And in this case, we had um, 30 sites in each area that we sampled repeatedly over time. And we just did this uh, in a, um, in, in early in the summer and then late or early fall. Um, so beginning of the growing season for the grass, end of the growing season. Uh, I, I think there's definite value in uh, sampling uh, a little more frequently to uh, follow these, these status and trends in seagrass um, seasonally, monthly. You know, it's always easy to say we should be sampling more. We should be learning uh, more. Um, but um, you know, you, I think some simple pilot experiments um, and, and sampling would, would tell you, you know, uh, what's your, your best uh, uh, per dollar, um, you know, what, what do you get the most out of per dollar? Um, so, and I, and I think that would probably be somewhere in the two to three, sampling every two to three month range, just, you know, off the top of my head. All right, any other questions? Well, if there's nothing else, I hope everyone had a wonderful educational experience. Let's all thank Charlie and Ashley and Laura for their lovely video. All right, thank you all for, for coming. And asking all such right. great questions. And uh, sign in and register for the next talk if everyone wants to uh, keep learning about some snook. <laughs>